the Literary Series, Hugo Literary Series. I'm Tree Swenson. I'm the executive director here at Hugo House, and I'm really delighted to have you all here tonight for this um, for these three re readers and a musician, including um, a very dear friend of mine, um, Jericho Brown. I'm so happy he's back at Hugo House. And also, I have to say, Rachel Kessler is also a very dear friend of mine. And I already have a new, very dear friend. So <laughs> anyway, it's going to be a fabulous evening. Um, and uh, we have this great theme that was cooked up, Area Protected by Neighborhood Watch. Um, and we're thinking about our old neighborhood. Um, and, and actually, our old neighborhood across the street from Cal Anderson Park, you know, there, there is some bad stuff that happens on that street. And I'll tell you who I would like to have watching my neighborhood for me, writers. That's, that's who I really want watching my neighborhood, because they appreciate all of the strange and overlooked things in the culture and the people and the places, and just like our namesake, Richard Hugo. And I want those writers there sniffing out every trace of racism and homophobia, and just through the power of their words, transforming all of that warped energy. So that's what I really want. Thanks. So, so Hugo House is really important for writers. Um, because Hugo House, too, really appreciates things that are strange and weird. And right now, as many of you know, we're working on a brand new home for Hugo House. And we've been designing a space that's kind of perfectly going to mirror all of the quirks and twists of the weird writerly soul. It will be a place that you'll walk into and immediately feel at home as a writer. And we're going to be moving into that brand new home, which is right back on the spot where we used to be across from Cal Anderson Park in June of this coming year. So really soon. Um, that is, it's a huge, huge project. But isn't every project that's really worthwhile, isn't it always like a really huge project? But we're determined to get through this project. It's just really important that we raise the money, that we pull everything together, that we finish the space, and we get there. Um, because, you know, why? Because writers need Hugo House. Because it's a place where writers belong, and we need to have that home here in Seattle. We need to make sure that um, Seattle, as a place, keeps weird in our vocabulary. And, and Hugo House is going to help that happen. It's going to help make sure that as the neighbor's neighborhood is gentrifying, that we're not losing the soul of our city. So we need all of you um, to help us. We need everyone to be gung-ho. We're looking for advocates for this project. Um, we are in full tilt high gear working on this, and it's going to be super, super excited. If you want more information, please find me either during intermission or after work, afterwards, or you can also always email me. I'm tree at hugohouse.org. Very easy to find. So um, uh, the other thing that I need to say is please fill out surveys. It's really important to those people who fund us and make all of these great events happen. They want to know who came to this event, what happened here. Um, so if you would please fill out, fill out your surveys and we will then dutifully give them to those funders when they ask us for information. And our funders for tonight's event include Amazon Literary Partnerships, Arts Fund, For Culture, Arts Washington, uh, the Office of Arts and Culture, the National Endowment for the Arts, and our media sponsors, KUOW, and The Stranger a and And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter Mountford. Thank you, Tree, and let me see about this. I'm a little taller. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Thank you all. Hey, yeah. Thanks for coming out. Um, 
So uh, before, in the second lit series of, uh, of this season, we have four every year um, now. And um, before we get started, I want to let you know about some exciting upcoming stuff we have happening at Hugo House. Um, the great Jess Walters, you may know him, the beautiful, wrote Beautiful Ruins, among uh, many other books, National Book Award finalist and other things. Um, and he's giving this really fantastic craft talk at Washington Hall on December 6th. Um, which is about controlling narrative time. So it's a craft talk for writers of prose, fiction, nonfiction, trying to keep your eye on the clock, you know? Maybe it's also sort of about like writing and like sitting there for a long time, as it sometimes is required. Um, and uh, so there's that. And um, I just want to let you know that there's a couple seats left in some of the classes. Um, Jericho and Porchista are teaching at Hugo House tomorrow, and there's like a couple seats per class and they're in the afternoon. So um, if you want to sign up, do it tonight before those fill. And um, we have an event. Um, we're so excited to be partnering with um, Poetry Magazine, um, Poetry, uh, on an event called Poetry Across the Nations, which is featuring, it was really organized by Natalie Diaz, the great poet and a uh, friend of Hugo House. And um, it will be here at Fred Wildlife on December 7th. Um, and so we're really excited about that. Um, and we somehow convinced uh, Eric Larson to come back to Seattle. He used to live here, but he moved away. And he doesn't like flying very much. Um, but we somehow like cajoled him on like a day when he was feeling really optimistic about the world. Uh, I don't know how that happened. I was like, just timed it right. And so he's coming back and um, we're really excited. He's gonna be at Washington Hall on February 22nd um, talking about his writing process. Uh, Eric Larson, as you may know, you know, Devil in White City and all those many, many books that are constantly on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, and uh, he, yeah, it'll be February 22nd. He's in conversation with Neil Bascom and get your tickets now because they will not be around for long. Um, and yeah, I think that's it for the exciting stuff that's coming up. There's many other things. If you look at our website, we have many, many other events actually and other classes, like 70 classes per quarter. Um, so, the format for the evening is a little different from if you come to a literary series normally, you'll, there's like song, uh, reading, song, reading, you know, this kind of thing. And we've, um, um, Honey Noble, Katie Jacobson, is, um, is gonna be doing one musical piece, which is as long as three songs. Um, so it's a slightly different format for the evening. Um, first, we're gonna hear from the great Rachel Kessler, and then we'll hear from Katie Jacobson, and then there'll be an intermission, and we'll hear from Porochista, and then finally we'll hear from Jericho Brown at, at, at the end. And so that's gonna be the format for the evening. Um, as, you know, as you probably know, the way the event works is that we commission new work on the same theme from three authors and a musician, and they come here to perform it for the first time. And tonight's theme is Area Protected by Neighborhood, Neighborhood Watch. And this whole season has a kind of overarching theme, I think sort of as Tree implied, of sort of real estate um, and uh, neighborhoods and so on. And so uh, our themes in the coming year are gonna be homecoming and there goes the neighborhood. Um, and in terms of n tonight's event, um, we asked the artists to sort of respond in whatever way they felt fit. Um, and Jericho suggested this theme actually, cause we had some like kind of middling ideas and he like came back with this and we were like, whoa, that is really good. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, <laughs> Leave it to the poets to come up with some really good <laughs> ideas. Um, but it was really cool. Um, and uh, the first thing I remembered, um, but things, when I thought of the, 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 the theme, I, the first thing I remembered those signs everywhere in the 80s when I was a kid with Boris the burglar. Um, anyways, those, uh, <laughs> I, I, I thought they might be, there might be, no, it didn't work. I'm getting the head shake <laughs> from the booth was so good we had them you know what I'm talking about though it's like an improbable like villain with his little hat and his trench coat because you know you never know um you want to obscure your identity I don't know um there's Boris that's his name though Boris the burglar seriously um and he was um uh he was that image was designed in 1972 originally um and it is still around oddly you can see it throughout cities um but uh uh I don't see it that often anymore. The, the notion of neighborhood watch is super old in this country, uh, and it goes back to colonial America when there was something called town watch, which was like neighborhood watch, but way more sinister. Um, I mean, they would like really, you know, 
frightening individuals roaming the streets and uh, attacking people. Um, and that was explicitly their purpose. Um, they weren't sort of being subtle about it. Um, and there's still some of those where they're like armed and so on. Um, and they sort of patrol in pseudo uniforms. Um, and the current iteration of Neighborhood Watch was born in the 1960s directly out of the murder of Kitty Genovese. You know about this incident? kind of famous uh, in 1962, people became outraged after reports that a dozen witnesses did nothing to save her as she was murdered over the course of quite a while, um, screaming. And it was really hideous and you know really rocked the nation and so on. And um, so they invented this notion. And then 48 years after that birth of this new iteration of Neighborhood Watch, um, there was a neighborhood watch coordinator in Florida uh, whose name is George Zimmerman, and he killed a kid named Trayvon Martin who was walking back from 7-Eleven with Skittles and fruit juice. And I, you know, that's sort of what I, those are the things I know about neighborhood watch all for you. Um, and I just wondered about all this watching of neighborhoods and like, what are we looking for? And uh, are you looking to help somebody in distress or are you looking for something else, and um, I guess that's what I've wondered about it always. Um, but it's my very distinct pleasure to introduce our first reader of the evening, um, Rachel Kessler's essays, poems, cartoons, videos, and visual art have appeared in books, uh, The Open Day Book, uh, Ghosts of Seattle Past, and WA 129, as well as The Stranger, Narrative Magazine, Literary Hub, Poetry Northwest, and Public Restrooms, for real, seriously. <laughs> seriously, throughout Washington State. Um, Kessler is co-founder of the Poetry Performance Collaborations, Typing Explosion, and the Visa V Society. She is currently working on a community cartography project, which is so fascinating and beautiful, called Profanity Hill, a tour of Yesler Way. And uh, it's just really awesome. And I hope you uh, get to learn more about that. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Rachel. Here she is. There's gonna be some slides, um, but there's not all of the slides that I wanted to show you, I don't think. I don't know, we'll see what happens. Um, so this prompt was really interesting to get because I've been really obsessed with this one street that many of you, I see a lot of familiar faces. You guys have heard me go on and on and on about Yesler Way in Seattle. Um, oh, and the images behind you, I should say, I just got back from Vermont Studio Center and I was, just thinking, fermenting on this theme. And so I did a lot of um, drawing of it and writing about it and sort of had my brain explode in the studio space I had there for a month. So that's what you're seeing back here was what I was trying to do with this, with this prompt. Um, I did a lot of map making, a lot of um, poems as maps and maps as poems, et cetera, et cetera, which brings me to, I was hoping the first image, but I don't think it worked out. Um, was going to be this map that my friend Amr made. And you guys can pick up your own. Is it free, Amr? It's free back there. Um, check this out. So this is, this is how I want to start things out, is I'm just going to hold up this map. Um, OK. And this is Seattle. Um, but it's Seattle as maybe we don't normally look, look at it. It's, um, it's an indigenous view of Seattle. It's um, the water lines that, that were here before like white invaders came. And, um, and it's also, it's oriented, not like how we usually look at maps. So this is Lake Washington, and this is the Salish Sea or Puget Sound. So north is this way. Normally on our maps, we have like the compass rose pointing north, but the, as Amr explained to me, I think I have this right, you can correct me, Amr, if I'm wrong, <laughs> is that the indigenous way of orientation was, was hydrology, was water, the connection to water. So um, we get our water from the mountains over here. Um, it comes into this lake um, and then goes out to the sea. So um, that got me thinking a lot about my own, uh, my own orientation, both directionally and sexually. and. Um, Anyway, I've been thinking about that a lot lately, especially over this last year, where um, it's been a really, really difficult year, I think, for a lot of us, um, both in the, the political and the, and the personal. Um, so I just wanted to start out with sort of, I don't know, I was trying to write this essay for you guys, and I just couldn't, 
I couldn't get it out. So I'm going to read you um, these sort of prose poems and, um, and talk a little bit about, about maps and like how, how we orient ourselves, not only in the space that we have, but, um, but in, our, in our bodies. And, and that the relationship that we have with place. Um, it's interesting thinking about Neighborhood Watch and like who, who is it that puts on these badges and walks around and looks at us and looks at the street. And, and growing up as a girl, I felt like I was, I was watched a lot um, and sort of under my own sort of neighborhood watch and then put myself under, under a watch. Um, and then I moved, I've lived in Seattle my whole life. I used to live about four blocks from the hospital where I was born and um, found out recently, I moved to the Central District about seven years ago and um, found myself obsessively walking Yesler Way and trying to figure out like what the history of this place was that I had moved. I knew that most recently the community there, the historic community of the Central District was African American and um, there was a lot of gentrification and me as a white person coming in, I was like, well, you know, what is my role in this and, and what can I do, what can I learn? And um, so I, I wanted to investigate the street and hear the stories that the street, that the land had to tell me. And in doing so, I found my own family history along this street. I found out that um, my great, great grandfather built a building on Yesler Way that was a synagogue in his day and is now the Langston Hughes Cultural Center. Um, and I had no idea. So for a few years, I'd been essentially, my, and my grandfather not only built this building, but he died on Yesler Way too in an apartment building. So he probably, in his office was in the Smith Tower. So I find myself like walking in the footsteps of my ancestors without even knowing it. Um, so if I have that connection to this place without, you know, in my unconscious or I don't know, maybe by coincidence, but I kind of doubt it, just thinking about the people who are my neighbors who are being displaced from this place that is, you know, historically theirs and the importance of that and the pain, like the deep pain of having, being cut off from your roots in a place. Um, and I went, recently I had the privilege to go to Thailand and when I was there, um, noticed that by each building, whether it was like a little tiny, you know, hut or if it was like a big, huge sky rise apartment, there was a teeny tiny in a certain corner of the lot, like a little tiny house. And I was like, oh, those are cute. Are those Thai bird houses? And I asked my friend and she said, oh no, those are the ghost houses. And every building you have a house to sort of acknowledge the, all of the people that have lived in that place before you and to, and to be sure that you know, that you were taking care of them and acknowledging that history. So I was like, that's what I want to do about Yesler Way is like build a series of sort of virtual ghost houses so we can know this history like as we walk it. And um, so I began talking to neighbors and interviewing people and talking with my family and finding out all this. Um, and I could talk for about, I don't know, seven hours, just ask anyone who has had to the <laughs> extreme displeasure of walking down Yesler with me. But um, I'm going to read you some poems instead. So I, um, in doing this, I got to meet, um, well, I, I knew her already, but hang out with Jill Friedberg, who started another sort of oral history project about the Central District um, called Shelf Life. And um, the Red Apple over on 23rd and Jackson, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Has anybody been there? Yeah. So they have the best grocery store music. Um, and they're, they're now gone. Um, that, that space is being redeveloped, and um, so uh, Shelf Life was a, is still um, like a community storytelling project. So I got to hang out there a lot at the Red Apple and observe the parking lot. So I wrote this kind of ode to um, the Red Apple parking lot. Today in the Red Apple parking lot. And then the children cast the flaming red hot Cheetos all about them, calling forth the name of the creator with piercing shouts and overcome expressions. Upon these vermilion strewings alighted the pigeon and the crow, feather to feather with their brethren. So perfectly did the pigeon's talons match the crumbs that we fell to wonder, which came first, such lipstick bright legs or these larval crackers? Bird and youth alike bend to the hard earth to peck and to pluck, to knit the cracked concrete back together, to hide the wormy soil gaping through. For the iron steed's open air stable erupteth into verse. Invisible drums shake the earth. As do red solo cups overfloweth, our laughter cracks the air. 
Youth in their finery doth promenade, swinging tresses and doffing hats to honor the ladies. And the smoke billoweth, plumped and brought forth by wind, an offering billowing to the heavens. And heaven rolls through these bodies, these celestial bodies, those who shine out, those who burn forth flame from lips. Heaven rolls through these bodies in an 808 state. Heaven doth vibrate. Heaven be here in these bodies shaking. And each hair and cilia throbbed through with bass. Heaven pulsates, a dance floor, an ocean stepped into, a death drop. O spirit, shake us. Make limbs breathe holy, and holy these bodies hit the pavement, and holy the tide swells and breaks us, and holy we pray, hearts above heads, asses in the air, the drum major undulates from fist to pelvis to ankle, he dances, the cry baby, and yes, we cry out, we scream, we shout and scrape voices into chords, we shake these hips, we lift these lips to blow dank clouds. With our tongues, we become the creator. With these mouths, we make things. Our speech puffs clouds, fog breath, clotted commands, cartoon speech bubbles. We speak the heavens and the earth. We speak, and therefore it is. We speak light and darkness. Our mouths build up and tear down ideologies, phrenologies, pseudosciences, false dualities. Our words are machines, clattering swords, doors that open or close. With them, we churn out nations, privatization, privation, until we reach the end of language. Our words, like blossoms, drop, and petals tornado all across this grid of white outlined parking spots. We lift our faces to the sky where daylight doth hide star bright mysteries. We have changed our throats. We have the throats of birds. We the people constellate this parking lot. For all over this exploded planet, some ancient gods rutted faces wept blood to gouge out the glory of spring. Unbearable rivers flushing down snowmelt, all our hearts singing into that aching. For as light grieves through gray thundercloud, all is holy. You guys can laugh too, some of that was funny. <laughs> um, and some of those are funny. I was just realizing there's gonna be some crazy clashing. Has, have the clitorises come yet? Oh, you have that to look forward to. Um, okay, <laughs> we're mapping the body, so. Um, <laughs> that's, wow, now there's, now there's gonna be a crackle. Um, so here's another a short poem about um, the central district where, where I live and some things that I've observed um, walking around this neighborhood and sort of um, one of these things you see with, with yep. gentrification happening, this idea that, that houses have good bones and that there was, there's nothing there, like as if there aren't people living there. It, it's this strange um, thing to observe um, and they just that even like calling it a rehab, I don't know. Um, another rehab in the CD. Oh, and this is also part of, um, I wrote this for this prompt, and then uh, Claudia Castro Luna, who was our civic poet, made a poetry grid, so a map of the city of Seattle and has different poems for different neighborhoods. So you can find this poem on, in the Central District if you go look for the Seattle Poetry Grid. Let the old houses be. Let the long lawn wave in quiet defiance. Let the red restless maw of new construction be silent. Let werewolf mutter along rafters, gnawing these good bones. Let the porch slope. Let the screen door creak open to crack street. Let the damp air blow through. Let the old houses sing. Let their rooms rattle full of grandmas and aunties and kids and cousins. Let needle touch black pool of vinyl. Let bass bottom out, speakers shiver through floorboards. Let broke down cars bloom dandelions like they did in our youth. Let the blue tarp fray in the rain. Let the old houses be. Um, here's a little a walk, um, and walking is a big part of my practice, my life as, a, as an artist and a writer. Um, I was in Chicago in a neighborhood um, called South Lawndale and walked and found this amazing amazing old park, and it was interesting. It used to be kind of 
like a golf course, which I hate, but it was really interesting to see it. It's now a wetland. It was like this, it was all roped off. It's where people go run their dogs. And um, it, was, it was beautiful. It was like the only time I've ever enjoyed a golf course. Um, so a long walk in South Lawndale. Do we become wetland when abandoned? Like the golf course cattails into lagoon, where every shadow shelters an old man fishing and the unhoused lie down under ancient ambitions colonnades. Now, this is La Valita. Aztecs harvested disease from infected maize and eat it, I'm gonna mispronounce this, hulajoche, thrashing song or sleeping ecrement or raven shit, commonly known as corn smut, which we spread on corn cakes named after shoes. It tastes of earth and smoke. The sky sings with fireworks and gunshot. Neighborhood kids run past, crush fireflies, dying green glow smeared in their wake. It's dry here, yet the birds chirp all night. Oh, I forgot to turn on my timer. Will you give me some kind of, are you timing me? I'm really worried, how much time do I have? Because I've gotten in trouble when I start to talk about maps, um, okay. Yeah, you guys just, you get tired. Oh, I forgot to say too, there's also, I made a little zine about Yesler Way, focusing on just this one part of it on Pioneer Square and um, Yesler Terrace, which is a low-income housing project where I'm an artist in residence right now. And the zine, for those of you maybe who aren't familiar with this forum, is something, we were just talking about this, that we used to do in the 90s when all of our friends worked at Kinko's and we had free photocopies. Um, <laughs> So I, I've just gotten back into them and they're really fun. It's like you can just spend a Friday night and go make a zine and you're like, yeah, I, I did that and it's done. Um, so there's, you can pay, I mean, it cost me about $2 because I don't have that punk rock discount at Kinko's anymore, but you can pay $2 for it or if you want to pay more, that would be cool. Then um, I can, you know, buy a hot dog later. So um, anyway, okay, so um, more walking. So this experience of, learning about my family history, talking to my neighbors, and I've been taking people for walks on Yesler. They've been taking me for walks, these memory walks, where they walk along and we're talking and I record it. But it's interesting like how memory works. Like It doesn't happen in this chronological way. And, and when you're walking, it's a very different conversation when you're face to face and it's like, I'm gonna tell you these stories, these important stories. Like All of these other little things come up. Um, and now I have all these different people's voices as I walk around and find myself having this really interesting experience of like walking in and out of different, different people's realities because I can hear their voices in my head. And um, I was thinking about Samuel Delaney's um, idea of paraspaces and how those exist and how the central district is a very different place for me than it is like maybe for my neighbor or for, you know, for someone else walking down the street. Um, so this is called Paris Faces Landscape. For I will consider my walking today. For the dead rat on the sidewalk warned me with its maul. For the sky hovered her worry. For the eagles fell from the sky clinging to each other. For my body continues to plummet. For the light reflecting off the water like electricity sparking from skin in the dark. For the wind troubles the boom against the ship's side. For the moss in its clinging softness beckon me to lie down. For my feet step into the same sinking mud every time. For the wide ruts riven by tedious tears. For the mascara wasted. For the bloodshot eyes again. For the tightly wound wheel of brain propelling my feet forward. For the electricity humming underground. For the crystalline caves opened under my skin still shine. For the glow at golden hour for the cracked concrete, blossoming moss, and miniature shrubbery, for the past that stacks along this seam, for this moment singing back and forth, vibrating waves, tides, time, history, for this chord of future, present, past, for my prayer, which is the same yesterday as today, for I will consider my walk, and tomorrow I will begin again. Okay, now comes the clitoris. So hopefully, has the clitoris map come through yet? Are we still, is this, has been the same image for like 10 minutes? No. It's, oh, okay. Maybe the clitoris map didn't make it through. Maybe like Google Drive was just like, no, we're shutting that down. Um, <laughs> sorry. So, well, I, okay. <laughs> There's what? 
Oh yeah, yeah, it says the word clitoris, and then there's a cartoon character I created that's the clitoris. I don't think we're gonna see it, because we've already seen this otter guy, sorry. Good, good, we can all make the, we can all make the mark of the, yeah, okay. All right, well, <laughs> sorry. You're just like, where is it? That's not a clitoris. That's a, that's a boat rudder. Um, yes. Kind of like a clitoris. Okay. Kinda. No one knows. No one knows I learned some things when I was creating the cartoon character. It's true, it's true, it's true. I know, that's why you need a map. I'm sorry you guys don't get this map. You're gonna have to buy the book. Um, yes, it was shocking, it's shocking. Oh, no, that's not a clitoris, okay, yes, yes. As someone who has had two children, like I still had to research on the internet when I was drawing the clitoris, so. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and this poem is kinda hot too, sorry. So, I, um, I followed my clitoris through an alley. Above us, the sky spluttered in disbelief. The map that my clitoris held began to smear in the rain. It was hard to tell if this was a road or a smudge. Song lyrics spray painted across a dumpster seemed like good advice. You said you'd give me love, but you never told me about the fire. I walked down back street in swoon, butterflies and knees buckling. Someone nearby pounded a hammer dulcimer. Tourist season was upon these cobbled lanes and the buskers unrelenting. I have made some bad choices. For example, a third or fourth or fifth margarita. Riding a shopping cart down a hill. Letting strangers from the karaoke bar do coke in my baby's car seat. There was not a baby in the car seat, you guys. But this journey guided by my clitoris, well, my therapist advised Follow your clit. My clitoris seemed so self-assured and walked with such authority. You might laugh at a woman worn down by longing, stumbling after her clitoris like a puppy on a leash, but remember how the children of Israel followed a pillar of smoke through the desert, which they trusted was God, and it took like 40 years? All they needed was the Red Sea swallowing some Egyptians, and they would follow that fucking smudge in the sky anywhere. At least my clitoris appears to be holding a map. I know what would happen if I didn't follow my clitoris down this alley. Go home, the clouds write. Wandering clitoris, where wilt thou lead me? She brings me to the mountain. <laughs> Stop, no snorting. Okay. <laughs> she brings me to the mountain. Together we ascend. We see the light and it glows from our faces. <laughs> she inscribes, you guys, <laughs> this is so serious and holy, okay. <laughs> You guys try to read this poem about the clitoris with Jericho Brown looking at you like that. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go back to that mountain. Together we ascend. We see the light and it glows from our faces. She inscribes stone tablets with manifestos. She sings a new religion. She shows me a land of milk and honey. With a finger, she draws a door and opens it for me. Golden chambers, one after another, unfold. The cave breathes and we are blind. We echolocate. We stumble back down together, falling to our knees, laughing like drunk teenagers, kissing stones and trees. The Torah is a long scroll, and my clitoris reads it to me. It just rolls and rolls, unrolls and rolls back up, and sometimes we take it out for some dancing, give it a kiss, and put it back. And we've been <laughs> singing this same song since Moses. Dang. <laughs> Yeah, we got through that, you guys. Thank God. Okay. Um, well, since there's not a map of this, uh, my heart rattling like an old Cheerio in a sippy cup, I'm going to skip that one. Um, I think I'm just going to end with this last one because it's probably time, right? Yeah, it feels like it. And this poem is a wild pony. Um, you thought the clitoris was crazy. But no, this isn't like that. This is just, I was, tr I keep editing and editing. I was editing this poem like 
you guys saw me get out my pencil right before, but I think it's just going to, um, I don't know, like it can't, it, it cannot be tamed. And I just, it, like I was trying to make it follow the sort of like, you know, narrative arc. And then I was like, fuck the narrative patriarchy. So we're gonna end on a wild one. This is called Ariel or Bird's Eye View. If I were a bird looking down on myself, I'd shit too. Is there another way to interpret this map you drew? A poem is like a map. It is also about what is left out. Topographic lines could translate into faux wood paneling, the basement where I mildewed with desire. I watched that wall for words written by an invisible hand while surely God watched me. Learn to lean into the male gaze. Let it orient me, both sexually and directionally. In secret, I learned the pop song lyrics that colonized my neighborhood of girl mind. Private eyes are watching you. They see your every move. I am the eye in the sky. I can read your mind. God and then this man on the radio see right into my soul, and that's how I know I am too much. I am broken. And the bathographic way you marked me, the way this once winding river now lies ramrod straight over ancient places makes me feel a little melancholy or maybe woozy. Look at the map and see a fingerless hand rising from the water. The sea is a ghost here. And that M of seagulls silhouetted could also be butts. Butts hanging BAs to the north to the compass rows that you impose. I also see boobs. Boobs raised defiant as middle fingers to the heavens, soft hills refusing to represent a bird inking its signature across sunset. The bird refuses to fly like McDonald's logos in the sky. The bird stockpiles aromatic woods because the end is near. The bird sets its own nest on fire. The bird resists, becomes the scent of cedar burning. The bird becomes flaming feathers and ashes, and the fields flood under the firebird's song. The water rises up. The land and water glow with stories. Maps are power, and around this land of unequal sections swims a whale who swallowed a table. If that table symbolizes a man like Jonah who got allowed to drown and Nineveh became America, have we carved our prophets into furniture? Oh, America, a crossword of curses, we're fucked. Begin with four fighter planes. Their whining rhyme overrides these drunk moms slurred debate on public schools. This paper does not simply represent the lay of the land. Can this language of maps protest against the hand contouring the new names? We argue and walk a small child on a trike. Imagine longitude and latitude as relativity and attitude. Contrary to popular belief, the bird knows when it is pooping. We push that tricycle so fast the petals slap her little feet away. Sweet nocturnal stroll, suburban rain dull. No one listening. The bird senses a storm and knows when it is dying. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, um, so now we have uh, Katie Jacobson. Um, and uh, um, she's a composer, improviser, and who loves to write in every style of music, um, including punk songs about being old, rhymes about going to school, sexy synth love songs in pizza dance parties. And Katie's thoughtful lyrics and powerful singing um, tie the everything, everything together, marrying seriousness with humor at every moment. Katie is currently involved in the bands Tiny Ghost and Honey Noble, um, and the interdisciplinary projects Command and the Honey Noble Opera, which will be premiering their first piece in June of 2018. And with that, here we go.
doors down, just a gray house there with the white fence and the little mailbox, and you just let me know when you're ready. Oh, hey, um, I'm so sorry, but I, I locked, silly Janice, I locked my keys in my house again. Um, I was just wondering, can I just, can I just sit with you for a while? You can have a cookie if you want. How was your day? one dish for about an hour. <laughs> it was enjoyable. I liked it. Oh. Okay, I think they're here. I'll just put them right on. Yeah, they're here. Oh my. I hate messes. I hate messes. I am so sorry. Just, um, this wasn't planned, actually. <laughs> No one step there. Okay. Cookie? No. Okay. Well, another day. I want to cookie. That's fine. I just baked them from scratch earlier. That's fine. Ralph slash Aaron. White as a sheet. Yeah. Hey there, this is uh, Janice Cunningham from um, Sunnybrook Falls. And just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself this morning. It's a fine, fine morning. And beautiful. Okay, so things Janice does like bubble baths, just so much fun. Uh, hot coffee in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon, and uh, long, luxurious walks with my two dogs, Jasper and Connie, my pride and my joy, that's what I call them. Uh, things Janice doesn't like, it's a toughie, but uh, I have to say, messes and leaf blowers. Yeah, just those two things, simple, really. Well, I'm a happy-go-lucky girl out of that. For breakfast this morning, I had just a little granola with some skim milk and a glass of freshly squeezed orange juice. Oranges I uh, just got from my orange tree out in the back. I've been growing, tending for a number of years. It's really a labor of love. Yeah, yeah that's me. That's Janice. Um, Janice has got you. Janice is here to stay, as I always say. And uh, I'll just, we'll see you around the neighborhood. Thank you so much.
And welcome to the Sunnybrook Falls Police Blotter, where we keep you in the know so you can know what you need to know. No exceptions. Thanks so much for tuning into our program tonight. And before we get started, we just want to encourage all you folks out there, hey, be a good neighbor, won't ya? 
Make sure to keep your eyes peeled, your doors locked, and the Sunnybrook PD on speed dial, and you'll make sure to keep your community a safer space and a safer place. Not as many reports tonight as last week, but all the same. Let's get started. Ralph? <laughs> spilled two cups of bleach on a dryer and was concerned about the fumes on South Beach Road. I'm so concerned about these fumes! A man reportedly was riding a moped naked on Tuttle Avenue. The man was also up all night with a campfire cutting wood. a suspicious man walking in the alley and yelling on North Madison Street. I love dogs, and I'm very scary. Five dogs were consistently barking on East 4th Street. <laughs> a couch with a sign that says it is infested with bed bugs reportedly you was on North Oaks Avenue. You should keep me. It won't itch at all. A suspicious looking clown was reported sitting in an alley off of Walnut Lane. <laughs> A man reportedly was curled up in the bushes on South Industrial Way. A person in an older Dodge Ram pickup reportedly was smoking marijuana in the parking lot at Irene Reinhardt Park. Tell you what. A man reportedly had his shirt pulled above his stomach and was rolling around on the ground on Canyon Road. Well, thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. Until next time, we're signing off. Stay safe and good night. Snapchat my face and people can like what I post.
Um, but it's, I'm very excited to introduce um, uh, uh, Porochista. Um, Porochista Kokpor is the author of the forthcoming memoir, Sick, from Harper Perennial, and it'll be out in May 2018. Is that right? Yeah? June 2018. It's okay. Oh, that's exciting. Um, that's coming up, actually. Um, and the novels, The Last Illusion, oh, I didn't bring that, um, uh, which was a 2014 book of the year, according to NPR, Kirkus, BuzzFeed, Electric Literature, and quite a few others, and Suns and Other Flammable Objects, um, which was the 2007 California Book Award winner for First Fiction and a Chicago Tribune's uh, Falls Best and a New York Times Editor's Choice. She is currently, are you still the writer in residence at, no, you're not, but you were the writer in residence at Bard College recently, and then, and um, adjuncting at Columbia, no, 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 do that. Um, and, but visiting faculty, no, VC, are you, yeah, yeah VCFA, <laughs> the, the, teaching various places. Uh, such as wonderful institutions like that. Um, but it's my great pleasure to introduce, yeah, Porch Houston. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been such a wonderful evening. It's hard to follow all that. Um, thank you, Hugo House. I'd heard so much about you guys. And I've always really loved coming to Seattle. Um, I was saying on Twitter, I was like the idea there's like a pretend war between Seattle and Portland. And every time I come here, I'm like, I choose Seattle. And like nobody has that war. But in my head, there's this like really intense rivalry. But I really appreciate the diversity here and the sort of arts community. Um, yeah, and I just love who I'm reading with today. So this has been great. Um, so this was like a very difficult theme for me. And it made me think about a lot of things like... Do I have a neighborhood that I even identify with? The, the neighborhood that I've lived in the longest in the US really, other than the one that I grew up in that it was hellish for me, which was in suburban Los Angeles. It was okay, but mostly hellish. But the, I mean, the, as an adult, Harlem has been the neighborhood I've lived in the longest, where I live now. And I'm working on a really long piece about Muslim Harlem, which has been really helpful for me, especially in the last year. Um, but so I w but I wasn't quite ready to write about that yet, because I feel like I'm in the middle of that story. But then I just realized, as I kept thinking about that, that I've just never, ever felt part of any neighborhood or community in America. And I thought that there's a lot of us who probably feel that way, um, especially if you come from a refugee or immigrant background, and especially if you live in 2017, where you're constantly reminded that you don't belong here. Um, and then I think there's a whole thing about like how important it is to belong here, but maybe it's not important. Like, you know, I said recently at a talk that I don't even always feel very, um, I d I've never really identified as, as my gender, my sexuality, my race, my ethnicity. I've had times where I haven't even felt entirely human. <laughs> so I don't really, I think it's maybe even the belonging is a little un overrated. So then I really analyzed this. And so, you know, I'm, I've been working on a book of essays that um, hopefully will get sold soon. Um, we're just putting it together. And those essays are all my essays about being Iranian American and Middle Eastern and of a Muslim culture. And so as I was thinking of that, that collection too, this weird essay came out with this theme, um, which is called 13 Ways of Being an Immigrant. So it's kind of loosely tied into this topic. Anyways, I wrote it for this and then, um, Viet Nguyen, amazing writer, um, he's doing an anthology called The Displaced, which is coming out sometime in 2018. And so he accepted this. This is now going to be in that anthology. <laughs> so thank you, Jericho and Hugo House, for inspiring me to write this um, episodic essay. Um, and I wish it was more entertaining, but it's not really. It's like all my essays. Someone said, I did a reading recently and they said, we think of the word intense when we think of you. And I was like, okay, you know. But I've like heard that my whole life. I have to write a whole other essay about that. Okay, so <laughs> this is, it's in 13 parts. So 13 ways of being an immigrant. The year is 1983 and Cabbage Patch Kids are at the height of popularity. You want one, but you know your parents can't afford it. 
just a couple years into this country, and they keep saying that we'll go back to Iran soon, that the war will be over, that the revolution will be done, that she'll be a refugee and alien no more. But for now, there's no money for things. At school, you're one of the few kids with less access to things, and you know those others are not from here, too. You work with them to get out of ESL, and you try to act like the kids who belong here, who have money. One way to do this is to have a Cabbage Patch Kid doll, but this seems impossible. Still, your mother takes you to Toys R Us, which seems like the greatest place on Earth, second only to Disneyland, which you've only heard about at this point, since it costs too much to go. At Toys R Us, several aisles are devoted to Cabbage Patch dolls. If it were a farm, this area would be the Cabbage Patch. Their chubby faces peer at you from behind the plastic of their boxes. You have not considered which one you want because you don't think you will ever get one. Maybe an imitation one at some point, one without a signature on the butt, which is how you've heard you know they're real. True Cabbage Patch Kids, the real ones come with butt tattoos. <laughs> this is true, it's Xavier Roberts. I still remember that. Um, you look at them longingly when your mother points to a section down the aisle. There's a big sign, sale. There's a whole section of Cabbage Patch Kids on sale, it turns out, and your mother is telling you they're in your budget, but she doesn't think they're the right ones for you. And you are elated, then confused. Why would she think that? And then you look at them one by one, row after row. What do they have in common? They are black, all of them, the sale ones. You think about it. They could be your adopted child, why not? You're still too young to know how babies are made, so you don't think much deeper. You reach out to a pigtailed black one in a yellow tracksuit, and you tell your mother that this is your daughter. Her name turns out to be Clover Stephanie, and you still have her somewhere in storage. Her cheek is a bit scraped, which looks white underneath. It bothers you, that fact. It bothers you that you also have Clover only because she was on sale, because she was black. But that was your first lesson about America, so maybe it was worth it. Two, you want to be a good student, the best in fact. One way to do this is to follow directions. In kindergarten, this is a big goal of yours, since English is still new. One rule is that lunchtime, you must eat your dessert last. Dessert is usually a piece of fruit, but apparently it is hard for kids to obey this rule. Not you. You always get it right. Your best friend is a blonde girl named Angela, who all the teachers love. She doesn't always play by the rules, but she gets away with it, always. One day, she eats her cantaloupe before her spaghetti. This shocks you. You try to tell her to stop it, that she can't do this, but she does it. Without any fear, a smile even. You tell her to stop, or you'll have to tell on her. She smiles with a mouthful of cantaloupe. She is fearless. You tell her to stop right now because you are truly about to tell. She laughs, more cantaloupe on her tongue. You can't take it anymore. You tell on her. The teaching assistant is a big man named Mr. Mondo, and he is tough on the rules. He will take care of this. You walk right up to him, and as much as it pains you, you point right at her. Angela is eating her dessert first, Mr. Mondo. At this point, Angela is still, a look of fright on her face. She's not taunting you anymore. Good, you think, this might teach her. Mr. Mondo walks with you to her. He asks her if she did it. She nods, sadly. Sorry, she says. He says nothing and pauses. Then he turns to you and looks angry. He says one word, snitcher. He walks away and Angela smiles and you begin to cry and after you learn what that word means, that from the start you know it's something bad, once again you learn a lesson about America. Three, your best friend in second grade lives in the good part of town. So does everyone at your elementary school. You go to that school because your zone was full. You live in the bad part of town. No one you know lives there. Your dad drives a Pinto while your best friend's dad drives a Rolls Royce. She hates it. You go to her house which is a mansion in the hills. She has so many expensive toys, numerous Cabbage Patch dolls, all white, even though she is Vietnamese. She was born in America, unlike you. Her dad drives a truck for a living while yours is a professor. Another lesson you one day realize. Four, the usual substitute teacher, the one everyone in your grade sees most often, makes funny jokes, and one is that he calls you my Iranian sweetheart. 
you hate this because you know Americans don't like Iran and you don't want to be singled out and teased, especially not because of being Iranian. But he always does this. Another teacher sticks his thumb in your mouth when he spots you sticking your tongue out at a friend. You don't know what it means, but it feels wrong. Years later, a science teacher offers you massages after class. You decline. A few grades down, a German teacher tells you, you are so beautiful. He whispers it to you, and you never come near him again. That same year, a librarian tells you about the male and female plugs too eagerly, demonstrating over and over. Another teacher laughs when students say you look like Anne Frank and makes a joke about him looking like a German soldier. You remember his bad breath on your face as he laughs at you, all over you. Are there Jews still in Iran, he asks you, but you don't answer. In America, adults are inappropriate, you realize. Maybe a lesson for this place, but maybe not. Five. You become editor-in-chief of your high school paper, your one and only dream in life at that point. For two years, you have this post. You love nothing more. When your advisor is fired, a gay man, most likely fired for being gay in a very homophobic school, you are incensed and you walk out and your staff follows. You are now seen as a rebel. This somehow seems very American. Your fearlessness also seems very American. You are blonde Angela with the cantaloupe. You must belong here if you think you can afford to leave. Six. You go to college in New York, your dream, and you get your first inter internship at the Village Voice. You're a teenager and a scholarship kid, and you have no money, and it does not occur to you that students ask their parents for money. You are left wondering how you can make this work, so you learn to jump trains. Another scholarship kid teaches you. You get good at this. You go to your internship three times a week and use some change for dinner, Pop-Tarts from the vending machine. And then you jump the train back. Part of it is you must look very well dressed to do this. You pretend you're dressing up for your internship, but you're doing it because they suspect you less if you look fancy. One time you get caught, a female conductor. She tells you she's been watching you for months. You have no money to give her, so she tells you your luck is up and she's kicking you out. It's midnight and the next stop is Mount Vernon, a bad neighborhood. You are let out there and an old man offers you a drive home. You have no other choice. You stop jumping trains, but you also stop internships altogether. They must not be for you. Mm. Yeah, seven. Sometimes you stay out all night. You miss the last train back to college upstate on purpose, knowing the next one is at 6 a.m. No worries, the clubs are open all night. You go to them and you lose yourself in them. In America, you fit in at clubs more than anywhere else. They are for you. It's there that people accept you most. Very little matters in the forever night of a club, and you learn then to forever t trust darkness more than light. Eight. You go on your year abroad to Oxford. You joke you're doing it to dry out from drugs and drinking, but it's also somewhat true. But there you find more clubs and more drugs and drinking. They call you American Express, the group of boys you sleep with. You're just amazed they call you American. Nine. At age 19, you are raped. At age 20, you are raped again. This strikes you as something that happens to American girls, a rite of passage. You tell no one what American girls seem to do, too. 10. When 9-11 happens outside your East Village window, you remember your first nightmares as a recent immigrant in the 80s. It was always the same, men in dark clothing with machine guns and machetes loose on your city streets. They were terrorists and you were the hostages. In your dream, it's always in Iran. In your dream, you are safe in America. But not in reality, you realize, after 9-11. Your old world has now come for you. This is what being an American looks like now, you think, as you take your shoes off in an airport security line for the first time. 11. You become a published author, an American author. No, an Iranian-American author. Never does the hyphen matter more than when you are an author, it seems. 12. In your teens, you contemplate suicide. In your 20s, you contemplate suicide. In your 30s, you contemplate suicide. You are now about 100 days from turning 40, and you wonder how many more times you will contemplate suicide. You wonder if you'd been happier in that other life you were meant to live, the one where you stayed in Iran and maybe got married and had kids and maybe never became a writer. Maybe even you would have already died of suicide. 13. You are now 16 years an American, 
You become an American on November 2001, and you realize you could have had a child in that time. You have no kids, no husband, no home you own, no roots in this country, no real reason to be here. Trump becomes president in your country is on the list of one of those six countries of the Muslim ban. You, you are suddenly always a Muslim. Suddenly no one doubts your brownness anymore. You realize every day is a lesson in America, the real America, the violent one that never protected you. You remember blonde Angela with a cantaloupe glistening in her laughing mouth, and you think for the first time, maybe she was laughing at you. Why would you think you'd get anywhere here? On Facebook, you beg your white friends to do better. You ask them for ideas on where to live. You try to imagine another future that they have. You wonder if your Americanness is forever and if you will die an American. You realize it must, might be just as hard to shake being an American as it was to become one in the first place. You realize with joy you will die an American. You realize with agony you will die an American. You realize with horror and confusion and fear and disbelief that you will die an American. Somehow it is harder to imagine than dying. You wonder who has died because of your will to become an American. And you wonder also if they look like you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and we now get to our, our final reader of the evening. And uh, it's my great honor and pl um, pleasure to introduce Jericho Brown, who is the recipient of a Whiting Writers Award and fellowships from the Guggenheim. It's on the list. It's on here. We talked about the drive over. Um, the, the Guggenheim Foundation, um, the Ratcliffe Institute for Advanced Study from Harvard University, and a National Endowment of the Arts Fellowship. Brown's first book, Please, won the Academy, I mean the American Book Award. His second book, The New Testament, from our local-ish uh, Copper Canyon Press, um, won the Ainsfield Bo Wolf Book Award and was named one of the best of the year by Library Journal, Cold Front, and the Academy of American Poets. His poems have appeared in The New York Times, the New Yorker, The New Republic, Buzzfield, a uh, Buzzfeed, <laughs> and uh, the Pushcart Prize Anthology. He is an associate professor of English and creative writing at Emory University. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Hi. How y'all doing? Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you, Tree. Thank you to everyone at Hugo House for making this happen and for having me here. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to come up with this theme tonight. I feel like I did some curatorial work. Um, let's see if I can, I just wanna fix things to where, I don't wanna bend down all night. Did y'all take a picture? That would have been great. Do you want me to do it again? I can't do it again. You have to be fast. Y'all are too slow. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I like to have fun. My friend Janine is here. Where's Janine? Janine and I, Janine Walker, she went to school, we went to school together. I haven't seen her in 10 years. Isn't that something? She looks good, y'all. Don't look, she's married now, so give up. It's too late. You, may, you missed your opportunity. Um, I, uh, I, I'll say this thing and then I'll read some poems. Um, and this is part, part of what I was thinking about when they asked me about the theme, you know. And I, I really do think that this is going to be, um, this really is going to be our work in the 21st century. There's this line, you know, and um, we're going to have to walk it a little bit better. Um, and on one side, and. <laughs> on either side of that line, all about us. No matter what we do, we are participating in community in one way or another, whether we like it or not. I think it's a good idea to like it, um, <laughs> since you're not going to be able to do without it. Um, and the truth about writing, in spite of the fact that writing does have to happen in an isolated way, you really don't get to do it outside of community. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? 
Um, and people love to pretend that Dickinson was outside of community, but in actuality, Dickinson had the entirety of a war going on about her to help to create for her ideas outside of her that she was somehow connected to. And if you read the poems really closely, you see that they're actually really political and really about the fact of civil war and the fact of a civil war going on within her. But that's not what I was going to say. What I was going to say is, what I was going to say is that um, sometimes we, um, well, I'll say it this way. I know it's a really good idea to mind my business. Do y'all know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I, you know, some things I think, and I think, you know, you know, wash your hands, mind your business. Do y'all understand what I mean? Like, you know, there are some things you ought to try doing. If you in somebody else's business, stop. Um, <laughs> Yet, uh, there are, um, it is impossible for any of us to say we have not been in a community where we did not know some kind of sexual harassment or sexual assault was going on. And we live in a culture where that's just like, okay, and? Do y'all do understand what I mean? And so like, so what can we do to muddy that line a little bit more, right? Like how is it that we can continue to mind our business when we mind our business and yet be able to say what we need to say so that people aren't being hurt around us, right? And so that we ourselves are not experiencing certain kinds of pain or even so we're not able to do certain kinds of pain to other people that we indeed are capable of doing. So these are the kinds of things that I was thinking about um, when I came up with the theme. And um, I tried to pick poems. I'm always thinking about where love meets violence. So, um, a prayer of the backhanded. Not the palm, not the pear tree switch, not the broomstick, nor the closest extension cord, not his braided belt, but God. Bless the back of my daddy's hand, which holding nothing tightly against me and not wrapped in leather, eliminated the air between itself and my cheek. Make full this dimpled cheek, unworthy of its unfisted print, and forgive my forgetting the love of a hand hungry for reflex, a hand that took no thought of its target, like hail from a blind sky, involuntary, fast, but brutal in its bruising. Father, I bear the bridge of what might have been a broken nose. I lift to you what was a busted lip. Bless the boy who believes his best beatings lack intention, the mark of the beast. Bring back to life the son who glories in the sin of immediacy, calling it love, God. Save the man whose arm, like an angel's invisible wing, may fly backward in fury. Help me hold in place my blazing jaw as I think to say, excuse me. It's really an, an honor to share, um, to share this stage tonight with these writers who and, and these artists, these, these performers who, um, whose work has been so important to me. Labor. I spent what light Saturday sent sweating and learned to cuss cutting grass for women kind enough to say they couldn't tell the difference between their mowed lawns and their vacuumed carpets just before handing over a $5 bill rolled tighter than a joint and asking me in to change a few light bulbs. I called those women old because they wouldn't move out of a chair without my help or walk without a hand at the base of their backs. I called them old and they must have been 
They're all dead now, dead. And in the earth that I once tended, the loneliest people have the earth to love and not one friend their own age, only mothers to baby them and big sisters to boss them around. Women, they want to please and pray for the chance to say please to, I don't do that kind of work anymore. My job is to look at the childhood I hated and say I once had something to do with my hands. I'm so excited that so many people, it's like a full house here. Y'all look around. Look at all of these people coming out to hear literature. Hallelujah, Jesus. <laughs> I get so worried sometimes, and y'all just, y'all prove me wrong. I feel so encouraged here as a human being. There's the happiness you have and the happiness you deserve. They sit apart from one another the way you and your mother sat on opposite ends of the sofa after an ambulance came to take your father away. Some good doctor will stitch him up, and soon an aunt will arrive to drive your mother to the hospital, where she will settle next to him forever, as promised. She holds the arm of her seat as if she could fall, as if it is the only sturdy thing, and it is, since you've done what you always wanted. You fought your father and won, marred him. He'll have a scar he can see all because of you and your mother, the only woman you ever cried for, must tend to it as a bride tends to her vows, forsaking all others, no matter how sore the injury, no matter how sore the injury has left you. You sit understanding yourself as a human being, finally free now that nobody's got to love you. Does this go up? It's okay. Is it? Yeah, thank you. That's what we do when we don't want to get glasses. <laughs> Oh, I should probably tell you, this next poem, um, this, the title of this next poem, I don't, is anybody here from the South? Oh, bless God. Hi, how y'all do? Hey, hey, oh, it's a black man from the South. Too. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you. Hey, where are you from? Where are you from? You're from Atlanta? I live in Atlanta. Do you like Future? I just did an interview with Future. Did you see it? Where? It's very good. You saw it? It's very good. You should see it. Google Gerald, well, never mind. You'll find it. It's, on, it's at Flaunt Magazine. It's very good. I'm very proud of it. Anyway, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot I was giving a poetry reading. Um, so there's a word, and everybody in the world doesn't know this word, which is why I have to explain it. I, I grew up in Louisiana, and um, then I lived in Houston, Texas, and then I lived in San Diego, California. And when I was in San Diego, I learned that I have an accent. Now, this is something I didn't know, but I learned I had an accent. I was always told to either speed up or slow down <laughs> when I was speaking. And I found out that there were all these words that weren't actually words. People in Louisiana had just made them up. So, and I had no idea, because I grew up in Louisiana. I thought these were words. One of my favorite of these is the word finna. Do y'all know this word finna? Some people, y'all have, some of you are looking at me like I'm very strange, see, but I'm not making this up. People say finna, like if they're getting ready to go somewhere and somebody's, there's, if somebody's rushing, you'll, you'll say, I'm finna go, which I think is like, I'm fixing to go, 
which, is, which comes from I'm getting ready to go. Have y'all heard this? So I'm not making this up for those of, some people are looking at me like I'm making this up. I promise to God I'm not. Another one of these words is the word nim. And then, you know, sometimes it's nim. Oh, see, you know this word. So this is, but you're like the only person to see. I'm glad you're doing this because they'll think I'm crazy. You know this word? So this is a word. This word means that person and everyone you associate with that person. Right? So used in a sentence, if you see somebody that you haven't known for a very long, that you haven't seen in a very long time, let's say you went to high school with them, you're in the grocery store, you see them, they were a friend of yours, you've grown apart. Y'all know how this happens. But you might see them and you might say to them, hey, how you doing? How have you been? How is your mama and them? That's how that would work in a sentence, okay? So, I mean, that's actually longer than the poem. And them, they said to say good night and not goodbye. Unplugged the TV when it rained. They hid money in mattresses, so to sleep on decisions. Some of their children were not their children. Some of their parents had no birth dates. They could sweat a cold out of you. They'd wake without an alarm telling them to. Even the short ones reached certain shelves. Even the skinny cooked animals too quick to catch. And I don't care how ugly one of them arrived. That one got married to somebody fine. They fed families with change and wiped their kitchens clean. Then another century came. People like me forgot their names. So, thank you, finger snaps, come on. All right, beat poets, come through, Allen Ginsberg. Um, so I'll read up. Um, maybe I'll read a couple persona poems in the voices of some of those people that I think of as my own, my own personal nim. Um, for this this one, the only thing you need to know is that Janis Joplin recorded the Gershwin Standard "Summertime" with Big Brother and the Holding Company for their 1968 chart-topping album "Cheap Thrills." She died of a heroin overdose in 1970. She was a uh, she was 27 years old. Track five, Summertime, as performed by Janis Joplin. God's got his eye on me, but I ain't a sparrow. I'm more like a lawnmower. No, a chainsaw. Anything that might mangle each manicured lawn, a place I wouldn't return to, if the mayor offered me every ounce of oil my daddy cans at the refinery, my voice, I mean, ain't sweet. Nothing nice about it. It won't fly, even with Jesus watching. I don't believe in Jesus. The Baxter boys climbed a tree just to throw persimmons at me. The good and perfect gifts from above hit like lightning, leave bruises. So I lied. I believe, but I don't think God likes me. The girls in the locker room slapped dirty pads across my face. They called me bitch, but I never bit back. I ain't a dog. Chainsaw, I say. My voice hacks at you. I bet I tear my throat. I try so hard to sound jagged. I get high and say one thing so many times, like Willie Baker, who worked across the street. I saw some kids whip him with a belt while he repeated, please, school out, summertime, and the living lashed. Mama said I should be thankful that the town's worse to coloreds than they are to me, that I'd grow out of my acne. God must love Willie Baker, all that leather, and still a please that sounds like music. See, I wouldn't know a sparrow from a mockingbird. The band plays, I just belt out, 
please, this tune ain't half the blues. I should be thankful I get high and moan like a lawnmower so nobody notices I'm such an ugly girl. I'm such an ugly girl. I try to sing like a man. Boys call boy. I turn my face to God. I pray. I wish I could pour oil on everything green in Port Arthur. So, you know, many of these poems are obviously about um, the neighborhoods I've watched and people watching neighborhoods. Um, and of course, that means they have to be somehow or another often out of my own childhood. I, I, discovered, um, I discovered Janis Joplin when I was a kid because um, we had this van that could only get one radio station. And it happened to be the oldie station. I'm so lucky. The worst things that could happen are always the best things for me. So, you know, I grew up thinking Janis Joplin was the lit. I thought she was like, I thought that was all there was, was Janis Joplin. And, um, well, you know, I like The Temptations and I like The Supremes, too. And I thought Stevie Wonder was good. I, um, but I also loved, I really loved riddles when I was a kid. And um, so a goal of mine since, I, since becoming a poet, a goal has been to write a riddle that is also a poem. But I kept failing. Um, and I think I kept failing because I knew the answer every time I set out to write the riddle. So um, I finally wrote a riddle, and I, I did everything in my power to make sure I never knew the answer. So I really don't know. I mean, this is kind of a bad idea, but I'll do it anyway. Um, I really don't know the answer to the riddle, but maybe, maybe you'll help me figure it out. Riddle. We do not recognize the body of Emmett Till. We do not know the boy's name, nor the sound of his mother wailing. We have never heard a mother wailing. We do not know the history of ourselves in this nation. We do not know the history of ourselves on this planet because we do not have to know what we believe we own. We believe we own your bodies but have no use for your tears. We destroy the body that refuses use. We use maps we did not draw. We see a sea, so cross it. We see a moon, so land there. We love land so long as we can take it. Shh. We can't take that sound. What is a mother wailing? We do not recognize music until we can sell it. We sell what cannot be bought. We buy silence. Let us help you. How much does it cost to hold your breath underwater? Wait, wait. What are we? What? What on earth are we? What? Right after um, Barack Obama was elected the first time, I wrote this poem and I had no idea what it was about. And then somebody told me, somebody like in, a, in an audience, I, I read it somewhere and they were like, oh, that poem you wrote about so-and-so, I wish you would have written it. And I was like, wait, that poem is about that. And I, I didn't even, like, this is so funny how like, you know, y'all know this, I mean, many of you know this because you're writers, that you're like putting things together from your experience, but you're not realizing what came together to make the poem or the fiction or the nonfiction happen. So I, um, y'all remember right after the first time um, Barack Obama got elected, Henry Louis Gates got arrested for trying to sneak in his house, not sneak in his house, right? Like, it, language fails me. Yeah. <laughs> And then like, so, so like the, the neighbors called the police and the police arrested him and then they had to have a beer. Remember that? It's so strange. I was like, oh my God, things are happening and this is what I have to watch on the news, you know? I kept feeling like, I kept feeling like it was like some sort of like gaslighting, like something really in the world I needed to know was going on and they were showing me this instead so that I would never know the thing that was going on. Um, so I think this poem has something to do with that, but also something to do with everything else. 
But you know neighborhoods, right? Homeland. I knew I had jet lag because no one would make love to me. All the men thought me a vampire. All the women were women. I should have got a bigger laugh for that. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you, a, I'm gonna give you a second chance. <laughs> There's a joke at the top of the poem, and you're going to laugh. Okay, homeland. I knew I had jet lag because no one would make love to me. All the men thought me a vampire. All the women were women. In America that year, black people kept dreaming that the president got shot. Then the president got shot, breaking into the White House. He claimed to have lost his keys. What's the proper name for a man caught stealing into his own home? I asked a few passengers. They replied, Jigger. After that, I took the red eye. I took to a sigh deep as the end of a day in the dark fields below us. Some slept, but nobody named security ever believes me. Confiscated my Atripla, my Celexa, my Cortisone, my Clonopin, my Flexoril, my Zyrtec, my Nasoril, my Percocet, my Ambien. Nobody in this nation feels safe and I'm still a reason why every day something gets thrown away on account of long history or hair or fingernails or yes, of course, my fangs. So home stretch, I swear, just two more poems. These, these poems are short, right? So y'all are all right, right? <laughs> just two poems. I, um, uh, this next poem was, this next poem was written um, you know, after, after finding out about and, and be, being, being confounded by um, the circumstances surrounding the deaths of, of people like, um, there's a very long list of these people, people who have supposedly committed suicide while in police custody. Um, they include people like um, Jesus Huerta in North Carolina, who somehow managed to shoot himself in the side of his head while handcuffed, walking from the police cruiser to the building where he was to be booked. Um, or um, Victor White III in Louisiana, who somehow managed to shoot himself in the back after having been patted down, handcuffed, and put in the back of the police cruiser. He, shoot, he shot himself in the back. Um, and um, uh, we would all be more, this, this list goes on and on. We would, we would, I think, be more familiar with um, Sandra Bland, who, after having um, um, an altercation, um, of an argument with a police officer, um, getting arrested, and then being in a cell where there's, there's video footage of her in the cell up until the moment that she hangs herself with a trash bag. Um, and you know, you know you're, not, you're not supposed to be a conspiracy theorist. But you know, it's so hard not to be you know, when you're black. Right. <laughs> you're like, really? OK. Um, so here's the poem. And that list goes on, and it's really disheartening, right? And that just, then that just, that don't, I mean, that makes me really angry. But anyway, <laughs> because, you know, these are people, people have parents, you know, and you know, well, never mind. I mean, can you imagine somebody telling you that your child has killed him or herself? Can y'all imagine that? Okay, now imagine it when everything about the circumstances suggests that they did not. Do y'all know what I mean? That's so awful. Anyway, um, bullet points. I will not shoot myself in the head. And I will not shoot myself in the back. And I will not hang myself with a trash bag. 
And if I do, I promise you, I will not do it in a police car while handcuffed or in the jail cell of a town I only know the name of because I have to drive through it to get home. Yes, I may be at risk, but I promise you, I trust the maggots who live beneath the floorboards of my house to do what they must to any carcass, more than I trust an officer of the law of the land to shut my eyes like a man of God might, or to cover me with a sheet so clean my mother could have used it to tuck me in. When I kill me, I will kill me, the same way most Americans do. I promise you, cigarette smoke, or a piece of meat on which I choke, or so broke I freeze in one of these winters we keep calling worst. I promise that if you hear of me dead anywhere near a cop, then that cop killed me. He took me from us and left my body, which is, no matter what we've been taught, greater than the settlement a city can pay a mother to stop crying and more beautiful than the brand new shiny bullet fished from the folds of my brain. Stand. Peace on this planet, or guns glowing hot. We lay there together as if we were getting something done. It felt like planting a garden, or planning a meal for a people who still need feeding. All that touching, or barely touching, not saying much, not adding anything the cushion of it, the skin, and occasional sigh, all seemed like work worth mastering. I'm sure somebody died while we made love. Somebody killed somebody black. I thought then of holding you as a political act. I may as well have held myself we didn't stand for one thought, didn't do a damn thing. And though you left me, I'm glad we didn't. Thank you all so much.